welcome to uh, the Know Thy Pastor segment with Pastor Oswald Osborne, um, pastor here at Tree of Life Church. Um, and uh, we are here in the sanctuary and we um, have a few more questions from the congregation. Uh, and uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, the next question is, um, what do you struggle with or slash what are your giants? To be honest with you, the biggest giant struggle that I, I struggle with is self-doubt. Um, depression runs really deep in my family. Um, it, it affects a lot of people in my family. Um, and self-doubt really, I, I struggle with, um, even as a pastor. Uh, there are times that even when I have, a, I, I know I get my sermons from the Lord, and, and there's times that I doubt myself to even be able to deliver the sermon, which is it sounds weird as a pastor. Maybe it's something that I shouldn't put out there, but it's true. Um, Self-doubt um, is, is something that I struggle with all the time. I, because I want to, just not in, in church, but also in, out in the world, I want to be able to be a, a, a good representative of Christ. And um, I, I doubt a lot of things that I do. I, I, so much so that even my wife has to, you know, kind of check me at times and, 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 and remind me uh, just not who I am, but whose I am. Um, and, and truthfully, I have to remember, and I had a pastor friend of mine tell me this many, many years ago. Um, he asked me the question, whose calling is it on your life? And I kind of scratched my head for a minute, and I'm like, what? He goes, he goes is it your calling? Did you call yourself? Or is it Jesus' calling on your life? And it made me take a step back and realize that if it's, if it's Jesus is calling on my life, then Jesus is going to take care of that calling. Um, and even in, in my self-doubt at times, um, I'll, I'll find myself going back to that question. And I, I, I've, I've realized, uh, I'll say it this way, I've started to realize that you really can't measure the success of the sermon by the size of the altar call. There's a lot of preachers that will measure the success of their sermons by the size of their altar call. I love having altar calls. I love having altar services. Um, but I realize that the success of the message is if you are challenging the people with the message, if that message will challenge people. Um, and I believe that if you're challenging people and if that message changes people at times, you might not see it at the altar at the beginning. Um, but you'll see the change in people's lives. Uh, and I, I realize or start you know I realize that we're in the kingdom building business. Um, and if we're if just one person, just one person gets saved underneath the ministry that I'm called to, then it's worth it. And, and for someone who struggles with self-doubt, that's hard to understand. Um, especially because uh, being a former athlete, you know, as an athlete, you get all these accolades when, when things great happen. You get people cheering for you. You get people giving you trophies, you know, not participation trophies, because I don't believe in participation trophies. But, you know, you, you're always striving for first place. You're all, you know striving to, to be the best and, and, and you're always and I'm very very competitive um, so being that part of my life being used to getting the accolades and, and, and all that stuff and bringing that part of my personality into to the pastoral role of the personality you know the self-doubt can creep in a lot um, and, and and when that happens, you know, then I have to go to the altar and, and struggle and wrestle a little bit um, with the Lord and allow Him to to almost reset me to to let me know, hey, listen, I got this, I got this. Um, I, it's funny because I think that question is probably from a sermon that I preached a, a little bit ago, um, talking about cutting the heads off the giants and facing your giants, talking about David and. And Goliath, and, and, and it wasn't enough just to knock the giant down. Um, 
too many times we just knock the giant down. Um, but the Bible clearly states that David did more than that. David hit the, the giant with the rock. One rock, by the way. He didn't need the whole other bag, just one rock. Um, but then he went over and stood over and took the sword of Goliath and cut Goliath's head off and then picked it up for the enemy to see. And they literally chased the enemy um, with the head of Goliath, um, which is really an awesome, gory kind of guy story. Um, but that speaks to us today because we all have giants that we face, whether it's self-doubt and depression like me or our or even a, a sin that you have a hard time letting go of, or, or part of part of your your, your past life, um, we all have giants that we we face on a daily basis, and it's never enough to knock it down. Um, for us to, to be free of, of that giant, we have to cut the head off the giant, um, and we have to show the enemy that we cut the head off. He picked the head up. You know, he picked the head up to show that 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 giant, their great warrior, was dead. The giants, we have to realize, the giants that we face, they, they are they're almost warriors for the enemy. And if you get intimidated by those giants and you refuse to to fight those giants, then then you can't be victorious. Um, and, and you might knock it down one day. But the problem is if you only knock it down, that thing can get back up. Um, so we have to make sure that we, we just cut it off. Um, and and it self-doubt it, it self doubts a big giant, especially when you're in front of people. <laughs> you know, when, when you're standing in front of people, delivering the Word of God, there's no room for self-doubt. Um, I, I, I tell people all the time, and, and I even pray this, you know, I'm... I'm really not worthy to to speak the words of God because of I, I'm just I'm, I'm just a man I'm, I'm human um, but I'm a willing vessel um, and I have to be a willing vessel and to be a willing vessel you really you know to, to hold what needs to be to be taught um, and, and preach you can't have any cracks and, and to have a, to have cracks means you're not taking care of the giants um, and so we all face those giants, and the, the biggest giant that I have faced um, is, and they run hand in hand. It's basically the same thing. Is the self doubt and, and depression part of it? I have seen depression um, really mess with a lot of members of my family. Um, mess with me when I was younger, really bad, really bad. Uh, it's something that that keeps you know keeps trying to come back. But I've done already cut the head off that thing, and I have to remind myself that I'm already victorious over that. And, and if I'm victorious over that, then and if I've literally cut the head off of that, then it can't come back up. It can't get back up. It's gone, it's done, and it's dealt with. Um, name a few blessings that God has bestowed upon you that were totally unexpected. Well, um, since being here, someone actually blessed us with a, a second automobile, one that I have, didn't have to pay for. Um, they just said they wanted us to have it, um, to use it, and so that's a great blessing. Um, I'm, I drove it here today, as a matter of fact. Um, that was awesome. That was awe-inspiring. Um, we have had people bless us with food when we didn't have any food. Uh, one of the aw most awesome blessings, and I'm not sure if I shared this testimony at, at, here at this church or not, um, but when my wife and I were really, really struggling, when we were youth pastors, um, and we were really struggling, really struggling, we had literally eight dollars to our name, and it, all eight dollars was sitting in my wallet. And we went to we went to a camp meeting, and there was a gentleman that was talking and and and, and picking up, taking up the offering. It was a special offering. I think it was a missions offering. Um, and all of a sudden, the spirit moved on him, and, and he said, "There are there is somebody in here." that before you leave this, this place tonight, that whatever you give in the offering, God will bless you 10, 20, 30, and 100 fold. And once he said that, God 
spoke to me, pull out your wallet. And I said, God, I got eight bucks to my name. He said, pull out your wallet. So I reached back, pulled out my wallet. My wife looked at me and says, what are you doing? I said, God's telling me I got to give in the offering. And I, I, I said in my spirit, I said, God, how much you want to give me? He goes, pull whatever you're going to pull out. I said, all right. And there was a five and three ones. And I pulled out the three ones. And the offering plate came. And I, I put it in and went off. Sermon went on. Great sermon. I went up for the altar call. My wife went up for the altar call. Um, we literally just got into our vehicle. And my wife's, um, my wife's father called and said, hey, um, we received something for you guys in the mail because your cousin didn't have your mailing address. Um, you want me to open it for you? And she's like, my wife's like, yeah, go ahead. And he opened it and there was a $300 check <laughs> that was sent from Colorado to Ohio, which takes about three days. So the blessing was already prepared, and it blew our minds because we didn't know, we didn't know how we were going to feed our kids. We didn't know any of that because we were completely tapped out at that moment, and, and that was just jaw dropping. Um, it, that was a jaw dropping experience. That was like a oh my goodness experience. And then <laughs> I started laughing in the car when I found out out after I was done crying. I started laughing in the car. And my wife's like looking at me. She goes. What are you laughing about? I said, what would have happened if I'd have put my five, the $5 bill in there? Or if I put all $8 in there? And she goes, well, you really can't think like that. I said, I know, but that's just how my brain works. But, you know, God had already provided the way. Even before we, even before I even answered what he told me to do. Um, and to me, that is just, that's a phenomenal, phenomenal blessing that God has done in our, our lives. And you know, it's true. He, he blesses those that, are, those that are obedient to him, and he blesses our obedience, and it was just, it, it was great. And he's done so many different things um, in our lives, and, and it's just, it, it's unbelievable. It, it's, all, it, it, it's unbelievable to me that this great big God that created everything is so focused on me that he will provide my need even before I know that I need it. And, and it's just awe-inspiring. It's just, a, it, it's crazy. It's unexplainable. And, and it's just phenomenal, all wrapped up in one. Yeah. What is your heart for Tree of Life Church? I love Tree of Life Church. Um, I believe Tree of Life needs to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ in this community. Um, I believe that this church needs to get refocused and, and become a, an outreach, mission, missions-oriented church. There is so much stuff that's going on in this community. And there are people out there that need to know that there are people that are, love them no matter what they're going through and that are here for them, but even more important, that they're, that Jesus died on the cross, even for them. To be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ, we have to be willing to take the message out of this building into the community. That's the feet. And the hands is, is actually being the, the outreach-minded people, reaching out to the, the lost, reaching out to the sick, reaching out to those that, that have not even heard. There, there's people in Zanesville, Ohio, that's really never heard the message of salvation, never heard that Jesus loves them, never heard that there's somebody that died for them over 2,000 years ago just so they have the opportunity to be reunited with God, the Creator. The, the, and, and we have to be willing to go outside of the building and reach out to them and embrace them and, and let them know that there is still love, there are still people that, that love them and, and, and that their pre-notions of, of church people are wrong. Um, and that, that's really truthfully what, what we need to be as a church, is to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. Um, we're in the process of learning the five E's of the tree, um, which are five E words that are going to focus us into that mission and into what we need to do to, to 
to become a better church. We're a great church. We got great people in this church. But to become a better church, we have to get back to doing what God has called the church to do. This is this, this isn't anything new. This is this is a call to the entire church, to the entire body of Christ. Um, Jesus was Jesus's ministry was an outreach ministry. It was a missions oriented ministry. He ministered to the lost, the sick, the dying, the, the people that people forgot about, the, the the people that they didn't you know they didn't want anything to do with. He those were the people that he ministered to, um, and, and we're supposed to follow his example. And that's where we need to be. We, we need to, to learn here on Sundays and take the word that we learn out there on Monday, Tuesday, come back and, and learn on Wednesday night at 7 p.m. <laughs> and, and go out there Thursday, Friday, Saturday and, and start loving on, on people. And, and I believe that God is about to birth new ministries in this church. Um, I believe he's preparing us. Um, I, I believe that we have to be prepared and have things in place before it happens. I believe that we as a church have to be committed to excellence. Everything we do has to be done in excellence um, because that's what Jesus did. You can't find anywhere in the Bible and show me where Jesus did something half-hearted. He did everything in excellence. And if we're supposed to follow his example, then what do we have to do? We have to do everything in excellence. Um, we did an outreach, um, but we're going to do many, many more outreaches. Uh, our, the outreach we did was very successful. We, we did the, the um, personal care bags for the homeless. There's a lot of homeless people here in Zanesville, Ohio area. Um, but we're going to do more. we got to do more. We need to get out there. We need to let them know that there are people that, that love them here at the church. Um, there, there's many different ministries that I, I believe that are about to be birthed that, that is going to be outreach oriented. Um, and I think it's going to blow some people's minds because people's minds that have been here for quite some time, I, I, I think it's going to blow their minds. I think God is about to show off. And I love it when God shows off. And I think he's about to show off it, it, here in tree, at, at Tree if we allow him to. If we just step out of the way, the problem is we get in the way. If we just step out of the way, if we get, a, get rid of all of our personal agendas and just get out of the way, and like I said in, in, in an earlier segment, if we expose ourselves to God and allow Him to do what He wants, I believe He is going to show off. And I think it's going to blow our minds, and, and I think we're going to be, be on one of the greatest rides that this this church has ever had and there's been some great things that's happened in the history of this church and I just think that's just very the very tip of the iceberg I think we're going to see great things if we allow ourselves to become the hands and feet of Jesus Christ okay uh, the next question is um, what is important to you my family um, I, I am a, I'm a family man I always have been um, I, with this fly that's flying around, I, uh, I try to raise my family to teach them the importance of family. Um, I believe wholeheartedly that God was a family man. Um, of course, the very first thing that's extremely important to me is my relationship with Christ. Um, cause he didn't have to, he didn't have to save me. He, he, I turned my back on him when I was younger, and he accepted me back in. Um, but I believe that God is a family man. He, he created family. He told Adam and Eve to, to multiply. Um, you know, he, he created family. He sent his son. He sent Jesus down here, his one and only son. Um, so we have the opportunity to come back into his family. Uh, there's so many other examples in the Bible of, of how God deals in, in a family structure. Uh, so family is very important to me. Um, I love my children, even when they drive me crazy. And, and I, you know, we only have two um, in the house now. I miss the two that are out of the house. 
I miss my grandson um, so much so that you know when I get to FaceTime him I just wish I could someone would invent a phone that I could reach through and, and you know um, so family is, is very very important to me um, so much so that I I put family even above myself um, just because I believe that's what a father should do um, and seeing them happy and wanting my children to do better than what my wife and I did is, is so important to me. Um, as I said in an earlier segment, my oldest daughter is getting ready to um, graduate at Lee University. Uh, I'm so proud of her. Uh, my, my second daughter is getting ready to start um, school for cosmetology. I'm so proud of her. My son wants to, uh, wants to try to make a career, um, uh, even go to college for baseball. and. Um, I think he has the tools to do it. He, he's got to be willing to push himself, um, and I think he, he will. I'm hoping that he has a really great season um, here at his junior year um, here at Philo. Uh, you know, so he's got goals that he once set, and Ava's not sure what she wants to be right now. Um, when she was younger, she said she wanted to be a princess that worked at McDonald's. I don't know. Maybe maybe God will make that happen. I don't know, but uh, um, just just knowing that they have goals and and, and the fact that I want them to do better um, than what Jessica and I did, and, and seeing them um, trying to accomplish those goals um, is very very important um, to me and I, also to my wife. Um, you know, just seeing and, and wanting them to to be able to live the life that God has called them to live. It is also very important to me. So, and uh, in your spare time, what do you like to do for fun? Well, I would say golf, but the way I golf on the golf course isn't really fun. <laughs> um, you know, we, we do a lot of different things. Um, usually, spare time we're spent at a, a ball field. I've I've recently um, acquired a membership um, at the field house, so. There will be some working out because I do, you know, I know I got to lose some weight. Um, it was a lot, you know, I worked out really hard for this shape right here. Um, but, and it didn't, it didn't seem to be real hard to get in this shape. I wasn't always in this shape. Um, I, of course, I, you know, we, we've talked about going to the movies and stuff like that. Um, spare time is a relative term, to be honest with you. Um, I, I I've learned to, you know, someone blessed me with a hammock. Um, one of my buddies down in Florida gave us a bunch of hammocks. And sometimes I just like hooking up that hammock and sitting there and listening to the wind blow. Um, you know, I, I like taking fam, you know, taking my family certain places, even if it's just to get out of the house. I hate shopping. I hate the malls. But if I got to take them there just to get them out of the house and just kind of do that, then I will. Um, there's just, there's so much stuff to, to do, it, it's almost like we can almost in our spare time over schedule ourselves to where we don't enjoy the spare time as well. Um, I like sitting I, and, and just listening. I, if there was a beach close and I had spare time, I would just be on the beach. Um, I love the beach. Um, I could live on the beach with two palm trees and a hammock, and man, I'd probably be great. Um, but, you know, there's always, always things. I, I, and I enjoy watching my children have experiences in my spare time as well, because everything for them is an experience. Um, and sometimes I like living through my children. Don't tell them I said that. Um, but it's just really good to, to just enjoy them, um, even when they're driving me crazy. Um, and, and they do. They, but that's what they're there for. They're, they're there to drive you crazy at times. But, um, but yeah, you know, whatever is relaxing. Uh, it's not wrong to relax. Um, we're, we're as a society, we're we're too uptight um, right now. So we just need to learn how to relax. And, and sometimes in the spare time, I'm not a big reader. I've got some books that I'm trying to read to try try to learn some stuff. Um, of course, you know, reading the Word of God is different. Um, but, you know, just finding that, that relaxing place. 
um, in your spare time is, is great. And I, I would love to travel. I'd love to be able to say, yeah, I've traveled all over the world. I've traveled most of this country, especially the southern states, at least um, driving through them. Um, but, you know, I, I just like experiencing things with, with my wife. I love experiencing things with my family. Um, I like, I do like going golfing, um, even though I'm horrible. I don't think horrible describes it. Um, uh, I like doing that um, with, with, with the guys. Um, I'm usually the laughing stock, and that's fine because, you know, I'm a baseball player, and I swing my club like it's a baseball bat. Uh, you know, I, I enjoy, um, I got to take my kids up to the Cleveland Indians game this year. I enjoy doing that. There's just so much stuff that I, I do, like to do in my spare time. And uh, I like to have spare time, really. <laughs> but, um, you know, it, it, there's just so much that I can use to just just veg out or chill out, you know. And, and it's it's fun. Um, but when it's over, it, it, it's, it's back to work. And then you start wishing you had more spare time. So, you know, it, it's just one of those things. 